once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. My next guest believes we are on the precipice of a dark age, certainly a post-Christian era. He's the senior editor at the American Conservative and author of the new book, The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation. Welcome back to the program, Rod Dreher. Rod, great to have you back. Raymond, it's a pleasure. Now, let's break down what this Benedict Option is. You've been writing about this for a long time. It's the first time it's in a hardbound book. Uh, Break down the principles of St. Benedict's rule that you found so appealing and that you believe people can profit from from in what they're encountering in this world that we we all occupy. Well, I take Pope Benedict XVI seriously when he said that we in the West are facing a spiritual crisis worse than any since the fall of the Roman Empire. Mm. Well, Benedict of Nursia, St. Benedict, came out of Rome, the city of Rome, uh, because he could not stand to live in all that moral chaos and decadence. And he said, Lord, what shall I do? What do you want me to do? He founded the Benedictine order, uh, not because he wanted to make the empire great again, but because he wanted to serve the Lord in a time of great chaos. Mm -hmm. And what he did, without even knowing what he was doing, was lay the groundwork for the next few centuries for the rebirth of civilization in the West. His monks went out into Western Europe into a, in a time of great material deprivation. They evangelized, they taught the people how to pray, and they spread the faith. Yeah. And what I think, what I tried to do in this book is to say, what would St. Benedict today, if he were to come back to us today, what would he have to say to us, we who are not meant to be monks or nuns, but who are ordinary people, moms, mm-hmm. dads, living in the world, how can we be faithful to the Lord in this time of great darkness? Uh, and there's some principles that you sure. enunciate in the book. Uh, order, prayer, asceticism, um, community, stability. The question is this, and I spoke to some priests this morning, as a matter of fact, as I was traveling around, uh, and they, they, they made the suggestion that St. Benedict, in writing his rule, he wrote that rule to sort of homogenize monasticism in the world because there were so many different groups living in different ways. Uh, How is this applicable? Pope Benedict, St. Benedict rather, saw himself and his community as a part of the church, not the whole church. They weren't asking the laity to come behind the walls and lock themselves in. They did that as monastics, as religious, as intellectuals trying to preserve the church's deposit of faith. How is that applicable to us today in the West as lay people meant to go out and change and reshape that culture and that world? Well, the Benedictines can do what they did because they had intense formation behind the monastery walls Mm -hmm. and still do. When I was in Norcia at the Benedictine monastery there, I was talking to the monks, Father Cassian Folsom and other monks, saying, how does this apply to the laity? And we're not called to be monks. We're called to be in the world. But Mm -hmm. the way they've ordered their lives around uh, strong discipleship, prayer, fasting, Mm -hmm. uh, scripture study, and so on, forms their hearts so that when they go out into the world, when they interact with the world, with pilgrims who come there, they can be Christ for the world. Similarly for us, we who are working in the world, whether it's in journalism, law, academia, wherever, Mm -hmm. if we are going to be faithful to Christ as a witness to the world and to evangelize the world, we have got to have much stronger formation than we do today. Rod, in the Benedict Option, uh, you you really do I would argue you make the case that the, Bene- the Benedictines really are an ideal that we can take some cues from. But, you know, in my own study, and again, this could be limited, but in my own study of the Desert Fathers, monasticism in general, those church fathers, those monastics went out to confront the demons within and the demons without in the desert, in a hidden away place. Your Benedict option really is not about confronting so much as withdrawing. At what point do you confront the culture that you rightly so deplore? See, this is, I think, a common misconception about the Benedict Option. I argue that we have to withdraw in a limited way from the world so that when we go out into the world, we are formed as strong, well-discipled Christians so we can transform the world. It's not an either or. I think, for example, that we need to make our homes into domestic monasteries in the sense that Mm -hmm. we have to keep uh, the media out of our home unrestricted, you know, with smartphones and things like something as simple as that. Television, I mean, you talked in the book about withdrawing from television, keeping the kids off the cell phones, the, the dangers of pornography and other things. What about the pop culture at large? 
Yeah, my children, I have three children, mm -hmm. and they are not isolated in a bubble, hermetically sealed bubble. Mm -hmm. I lead them and their mother leads them by the hand to show them this is the world, this is the good in the world, it's even mm -hmm. outside the Christian community. God made the world and he wants us to partake of this goodness. But if you're going to have the kind of discernment you need to celebrate what is good and true and beautiful and reject the other, you have to be well formed in your education, in your prayer life, in your parish life, and in all kinds of things. So this is wit temporary or strategic withdrawal for deeper formation and contemplation so we can mm -hmm. go out and be Christ for the world and learn how to suffer, Raymond, because mm -hmm. that's part of the problem with the church in the West. We have forgotten how to suffer. Mm. We'll get to that in a moment because there's, there, there's a key moment in the latter part of the book that I want to call your attention to. But before I do that, David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, uh, wrote a lengthy piece on your book, which is a nice thing. What he had to say wasn't always so nice. I want you to respond to this. He writes, my big problem with Rod is he answers secular purism with religious purism by retreating to neat homogenous monocultures most separatists will end up doing what all self-segregationalists do fostering narrowness prejudice and moral arrogance they will close off the dynamic creativity of a living faith what he means there I think is the the that, that in that clash of faith and the secularity comes something that is important, a, a spark that revivifies, regenerates a culture. Are you denying people that clash through this withdrawal by taking all the faithful people and, and basically, you know, saying pull back and go to the woods for your own sakes and to save your children? Yeah. But that's just it. I'm not saying that. I'm, I, this is a common misreading of the Benedict okay. option. I don't say head for the hills. If people feel called to go live an agrarian life or something, good for them, but that's not what I'm called to do, and that's not what most Christians are called to do. What I think we have to have communities that are porous, somewhat porous, mm -hmm. so we can keep from getting crazy. I write in the book about uh, certain communities that have struggled with this, with the abuse of authority if they try to separate too much. I interviewed a young woman who had been raised Catholic. Uh, she's an atheist now, and so are her older brothers and sisters Why? because her parents were so fearful. They retreated out to the, a rural area to, to make sure their children, were, their purity was not damaged by the world. They made their kids crazy and they made, the, the face of the church they showed to the children was one of fear and in fact terror. And that is not what I'm calling for. We have got, that's one way that we as the church can be, can help keep each other accountable, hmm. you know. There, there is a, um, in reading the book, and there, there are, there are, uh, you bring in a lot of historical antecedents. You talk about uh, the Czech Republic. I mean, you, Italy. You bring in various examples of how the principles can be utilized and implemented in a practical way. At the same time, it is, Rod, a dark reading of the culture and the moment we're in now. And you write the following. You say, peering into the near future, the world of work looks uncertain for everyone, especially for Christians. The practical challenge facing us are unlike any that most believers in this country have ever dealt with. Schools and colleges, morally, spiritually, and vocationally, will have to prepare young believers for some increasingly harsh realities. And you write about this many times in the book, that Christians have to get used to the notion that you're going to be marginalized, you're not going to be able to find work. Is that, is that a real do you really believe that? I mean, in the time when we have a Neil Gorsuch going to the Supreme Court, when you've got um, uh, directors and actors and screenwriters and novelists and writers like yourself, guy on the New York Times bestseller list, how is this marginalization and a, a, a quieting and shushing of a faithful impulse? If you talk to law professors who study religious liberty, if you talk to people in the medical profession who see what's coming, mm -hmm. if you talk to people in education and academia, it's all going in the same place. If you dissent from the, what the culture has come to believe mm -hmm. about gay rights, that's, that's the tip of the spear. It's not only about gay rights, but that is the point on which that the uh, activists and, uh, are trying to take away the religious liberty of the church and of Christian institutions. Mm -hmm. It's coming. It's just not a time to panic, but it is a time to prepare for it. What is going to happen when you are asked, we are asked to compromise our, our faith just for the sake of keeping our jobs, just burn a little pinch of incense to Caesar, it'll be okay. These times are coming, and you can look at the culture, especially at the young people, the millennial generation. They have 
almost completely, even within the church, thrown aside what the church teaches and what the Bible teaches about the meaning of sex and sexuality. This is going to have a political effect. If people think that voting for Donald Trump is going to save us, yeah, maybe it has bought us a time of reprieve, but even if Donald Trump were a saint, he could not turn back this tide of secularization and of eroticization of the culture that has been building for centuries. I'm just telling people, get ready, it's coming. We have got to train our kids to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three faithful Hebrews in the book of Daniel who, they worked for the state, they worked for the king, but when they were put to the test and told to bow before the idol, they said, you can kill us before we'll apostatize. We may not come to that in our country. I hope, to God, we don't in our lifetime, but we could die a death of the faith by a thousand cuts. And I'm just saying that we have to prepare for this day. Mm -hmm. We have to raise ourselves and train ourselves to make the right choice when we're put to the test. What do you hope will be the reaction uh, from people reading this book? And I'm not talking about Christians reading the book. I'm talking about the wider world, uh, the secular world who perhaps have never considered these ideas. What, what are you hearing from them and what do you hope their reaction will be? You know, I have to tell you, Raymond, I, I have a friend who works in New York journalism who was telling me just yesterday, he said, you would be surprised at how many secular liberal people are interested in the idea of the Benedict option because even though they're not Christians or maybe don't, don't take Christianity that seriously, mm -hmm. they feel that the wheels are coming off in this society, that something dark is coming, something chaotic is coming, and they themselves long for community and a sense of stability w within which to embed themselves for the sake of living a, a moral life. Mm -hmm. And I hope that they will read this. I hope they'll convert. I hope that they will come to Christ because I believe Christ is, is true, what he said is true, and he is the savior of the world. Mm -hmm. But even if they don't do that, I hope they can at least respect where we Christians come from and give us the room to be faithful. And, and I hope that Christians who read this, Raymond, will realize, wake up and realize the signs of the times. Pope Benedict said it himself. He said that we are going into a dark time, but we, the, the church that will survive is the church of the really convinced, mm -hmm. who will live out the faith with joy, not with anger and fear, but with joy and serve Christ and serve the world. And from that mustard seed, real renewal will come. Mm -hmm. uh, before I let you go, many say, look, th this, this book might have had more resonance if Donald Trump hadn't been elected because there was there really was a sense of hopelessness not only in the in the culture at large but in the body politic for people who do believe who felt their religious uh, views were being under attack and their and their deeply held beliefs and values has that math changed at all in your opinion now I'm asking you to put on your political hat. Oh, no, no, no. With You're the right. election of Donald Trump. You're right. I wrote this book assuming that Hillary Clinton would be elected, mm. and we knew what that would mean for religious liberty. It would be under even worse attack. God had other plans, um, and I think that, you know, I, I can certainly understand why Christians afraid of religious liberties loss would vote for Trump. But look what we have now. I mean, I'm excited Neil Gorsuch is, is, has been nominated, but Trump hasn't issued a religious liberty executive order that we all hoped he would. And um, so I'm skeptical about what he can do. But even if Trump does everything we religious conservatives want him to do, it's not going to turn the culture around, and it's the culture that we as believers have got to pay closer attention to. It's not about politics, it's about culture. And you turn that around how in 30 seconds? How do you turn the culture around? Well, it starts in our own families, it starts in our own parishes. In Dante's uh, Purgatorio, Dante the Pilgrim was told, you want to turn things around? Start in your own heart. Start with repenting in your own heart. Spread out to the family, to the parish, and then trust God. God will renew the world in his own time, but he can only do it if we're faithful. Rod Dreher, thanks for being thanks. here. The book is The Benedict Option, a strategy for Christians in a post-Christian nation by Rod Dreher. It's available online and at bookstores everywhere.